Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Get Ready With Me and Talk About Stuff. My name is Stephanie McCown, and I'm your host. I say that every time, and it's like, why do I need to say that I'm your host? Obviously, I'm your host. I think it's because I'm used to doing a podcast where people can't see me, and I just feel a need to reiterate that I am, in fact, there and hosting. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, here we are. It's been a little bit. Um, I've had a lot of stuff going on, and I also haven't felt like super inspired lately to do a video. There's been, not been a topic that really just grabbed my attention to the point that I felt I needed to make a video about it, and I really want to give you quality stuff, so I'd rather not make a video at all than make a video just to make one and give you mediocre content. And then yesterday, inspiration struck, and I knew what I was going to do. It might interest you to know how I arrived at the topic, and this is how I arrive at many topics. So Saturday morning, I woke up and Billy Brotherton was on my mind. I think it's because I had a conversation about bat removal a, um, Saturday morning, or no, no, Sunday morning I woke up and Billy Brotherton was on my mind, and it's because of a conversation I had on Saturday. Now, if you don't know who that is, that is the guy who was formerly known as Billy the Exterminator. And I used to watch his show all the time, and I thought, I wonder whatever happened to Billy Brotherton. I should probably look that up at 6 a.m. on a Sunday. So I did. And when I saw what he is up to now and how he dresses now, which if you know anything about Billy Brotherton, he's always dressed a little more out there, and that has not changed. Um, the way he was dressed reminded me of Papa Legba, which then reminded me of New Orleans, which then reminded me, hey, didn't they at one point have a serial killer, axe murderer person who demanded that people play jazz? And if they did that, then he would stop killing people? I think they did. And lo and behold, that is how we landed on the topic of the Axe Man of New Orleans. So... Here we are. Now, the reason I remembered this, before I get into it, I want to tell you, I am going to be describing crime scenes. This may not be suitable for all viewers. If that's something you're, you're sensitive to, maybe this video is not for you. Um, but if you do hang around with me, I hope that you enjoy learning with me, because this was very interesting for me. I The only thing I really knew about the Axeman came from this letter which was published on March 14th, 1990 in the Times-Picayune, and it was, it's, a, it's a long letter. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to read to you this one part of it, and then we're going to get into the Axeman and who he, who he might have been, everything he did, so on and so forth. But this was what I remembered about him, and this was all I knew. So it says, after a greeting where he says, uh, from, it's from hell, apparently, esteemed mortal of New Orleans, yada, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Undoubtedly, you Orleanians think of me as a most horrible murderer, which I am, but I could be much worse if I wanted to. If I wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens and the worst, for I am in close relationship with the angel of death. Now, to be exact, at 12.15, earthly time, on Tuesday night, I am going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I am going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well then, so much the better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is, some of you, your people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Well, as I am cold and crave the warmth of my native Tartarus, it is about time I leave, my, leave your earthly home. I will cease my discourse, hoping that thou wilt publish this, that it may go well with thee. I have been, am, and will be the worst spirit that ever existed, either in fact or in realm of fancy, the Axe Man. We're going to come back to that letter in a little bit. But who is the Axe Man? I really honestly did not know much about him other than the fact that he killed people with an axe. Hence, he was given the name 
by the Times Picayune, the Axe Man. And apparently, from what I read, the Times, or the, yeah, the Times Picayune really just ran with this. They, as media does today, they just hyped it up. So it would make sense that um, this letter would would be sent to them. So the Axe Man, though, he was. I'm supposed to be putting on makeup while I do this, and I've not been. My apologies. So the Axe Man was a serial killer who terrorized New Orleans and the surrounding areas from 1918 to 1919. Um, he attacked 12 people. Of the 12, he left six dead. And he was dubbed the Axe Man because of his practice of attacking people. Um, in the things I read, it said with their own axes. I wasn't able to confirm that from every source, though. But what we do know is he definitely attacked people with an axe. Um, and as we just read, he, a letter from the Axe Man demanded jazz so to prevent further attacks. And the Axe Man targeted primarily, now this I did not know, he targeted primarily um, Italian Americans. Now the first attack happened on May 23rd, 1918. He attacked Joseph and Catherine Maggio, who were Italian grocers. They were, um, he broke into their home found them asleep in their beds. He slit their throats. Um, Miss Catherine Maggio was, her, her throat was slit so deeply that she was nearly decapitated. And Joseph Maggio, um, his throat was slit. And then as a parting gift, I guess, <laughs> before he left, the ax man also took an ax and bashed in their heads. Um, there is speculation that he did that so the real cause of death couldn't be determined. But Whatever the case may be, uh, these people were not discovered till about two, two, two and a half hours later. Um, apparently, Joseph Maggio was still alive, but he would die shortly thereafter from his injuries. And this would go on. Um, the Axe Man would continue to target or to, to attack people, primarily Italian Americans, for um, the next year. And he wasn't discriminate in who he attacked um, as far as age or gender or, you know, health disposition or whatever. I mean, he was like, once he had you in his sights, that was it. In fact, and on, eight, on August 5th, 1918, he attacked a woman named Ann Schneider. She was eight months pregnant. Now, she would survive her attack and go on to give birth to a healthy baby girl, um, but later on in his attacks, the axe man would attack a family that had a two-year-old child, and he he killed the child. So he was not um, he was not someone who was going to be very careful about you know he didn't care that much about if you were a child, if you were a woman, you're pregnant, whatever. He didn't care if if he was there to kill you, he was going to get the job done, or at least do his best to make sure he, you know, do his best to get the job done. And if you survived, all the better for you. But as I mentioned, six people did not survive the attacks. Now, there was never really a clear motive given for why they, um, why the ax man attacked because they never caught him. But there was a lot of speculation. So I'm going <laughs> to, some of these are wild ideas about why he attacked. So let's get into some of those. One of the Speculations was that the Axe Man was attacking Italian people. He attacked others too, but mostly attacking Italian people. And it was um, as some sort of revenge for black musicians who were not being given their due credit for the um, invention of jazz. That's, I mean, <laughs> when you hear it, you're like, oh, come on. But let me explain. So post-Civil War New Orleans was a very different place. Um, you know, there were people, there were black people, white people, Jewish people, Italian people, Creole people, everybody living together. And it was a very, um, very much not the segregated society some people wanted. And... The, the culture that grew out of that is a reflection of that. And part of that culture was jazz. And jazz would thrive in 
the clubs and in the dance halls and so forth. And uh, I think nowadays, even still, we know it as primarily a, a, a musical, uh, a style of music that came from black musicians. Now, back in 1917, I believe it was, let me check my notes. It's been a while since I've done this and I feel really out of practice. So yes, in the first, um, the first official jazz recording happened in 1917 and it was recorded by an Italian American named Nick LaRocca. Now, Nick LaRocca and many other people would claim that Nick LaRocca and his band, the original Dixieland jazz band, invented jazz. Now, obviously, this might not sit well with a lot of people, and one of the reasons for that is because the album, I don't know, it wasn't really an album, I think it was one song that was recorded, but um, it had a jazz-like feel to it, but it wasn't jazz. There was no improvisation, it just had a jazzy sound. And so some people really took offense to the fact that not only was it not jazz, but was being promoted as jazz, but it also didn't give due credit in claiming that he had invented jazz. It obviously didn't give due credit to the black musicians who had really developed the style and the sound. Some people think that the Axeman was uh, really mad about that. And so he decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to go start bashing people's heads in with an ax until black musicians get their due credit. Little spec little, little skeptical about that one. Now, another theory is that the Axe Man was upset that the red light district in New Orleans had been shuttered by the Navy in 1917. And as always, there's always something I forget to look up. I did not look up why that happened. I have no idea why the Navy went in there and decided that the red light district needed to be shuttered, but that's what happened. Now, why would that matter? I think a lot of times when people think of a red light district, they think brothels and they think that's all that's there. But that's not the case. Broth uh, yes, there were brothels, but the red light district also had gambling dens and perhaps more importantly to the Axe Man, it also housed the clubs and dance halls where jazz music was really thriving. And so the speculation is that um, the Axe Man was angry about that and decided to carry out his vengeance against um, Italian Americans who maybe in his mind had ordered the shuttering of the Red Light District. I don't know. But that is one of the speculations because shuttering the Red Light District means less jazz. I'm kind of skeptical about that one as well. Um, there is also the speculation that the person who wrote the letter to the Times-Picayune was a marketing genius. And the reason for that being because the red light district had been shuttered, um, obviously jazz musicians were not being, they weren't getting a lot of work. I mean, if there's no place to go play, where what are you gonna do? So some people think that the person who wrote that letter was a marketing genius because on March 18th, 1919, which was the um, night in question, indeed every dance hall was filled all jazz bands had a gig, they were getting paid, and some people think that at least as far as the letter goes, that was the ultimate goal. So, most likely though, what was happening was the Axeman, um, the Axeman murders were more likely than anything rooted in racism and xenophobia and had absolutely nothing to do with jazz. Now, as I mentioned, the Axeman did target Italian grocers or Italian Americans, and I believe most of them were grocers. Why would he do that? Well, most Italian immigrants um, at the time came from Sicily. They had darker skin. They did not fit in well with black or white society. Um, so automatically right there, you have a dose of racism and xenophobia at work. And keep in mind that, that Italians in uh, New Orleans was nothing new. They had been there long before the Civil War. It, they had just been part of the fabric of New Orleans for a very long time. But what happened was after the Civil War, 
some people were really bothered by the fact that Italian Americans were not only happily coexisting with uh, black Americans, but they were also willing to work at these sugarcane plantations for very low wages, meaning that you know, they were taking jobs that white people would not take, but in doing that, they were allowing themselves the opportunity to, um, you know, create a new life for themselves. They could work two or three years at a sugar cane, sugar cane plantation and they could save up money to eventually start their own business. Now, it was not only that they were taking jobs that allowed them for a better future, but they were also working side by side with black Americans and the, the sentiment was that these Italian Americans were no better than Negroes and they were given the, um, the racial slur Dago was, was attached to them. They were, you know, that's where that came from apparently. Um, but they were, you know, all, all thing, you know, Looking at the whole picture, I mean, they were just not received as people who were on equal footing as others. Um, they couldn't assimilate well into white society or black, and they were right in the middle, but that didn't bother them. They were just there doing their thing, and some people really took issue with that. Um, so they considered, they faced considerable obstacles due to racism and xenophobia, both before and after the Axeman murders. Um, for example, in 1929, this so this is after the Axeman murders, a judge in New Orleans said of Sicilians, they are of a thoroughly undesirable character, being largely composed of the most vicious, ignorant, degraded, and filthy paupers with something more than an admixture of the criminal element. This was the sentiments that were expressed about uh, Italian Americans. They were viewed with suspicion. They were considered to be inherently violent. On March 14th, 1891, 11 Italian Americans were lynched in New Orleans um, for the 1890 murder of police chief David Hennessy. Now, Hennessy had been involved in an ongoing um, feud between the Provenzano family and the Matranga family, I believe. I can't read my own writing here. And they were business rivals. So there was um, there was an ongoing feud between them. They were fighting for territory, basically. And sometimes that fight became violent. Now, apparently, um, this police chief had been instrumental in sending several members of, the, of both families to prison. And there were some um, appeals coming up. And from what I read, he was about to present new evidence that was going to make sure that these people stayed in prison. That did not go over very well, as you might imagine. And on his way home, walking home from work one day, he was gunned down. And apparently with his dying breath, he said to the, another officer who had come to assist him, the day goes got me. Now, the there were trials. Um, and... Some of the people who were put on trial were acquitted. There were people who believed that the acquittals were the result of a bribe from the families because the families were apparently very, you know, they had wealth and they had power. And sometimes, as we know, regardless of race, creed, whatever, if you have wealth and power, sometimes you're going to use that to get what you want. Now, did that happen here? We don't know. Um, the people who, so what happened was a mob went to the jail. They took out these 11 people who were, who had been tried or were about to be tried for the murder of, um, officer Hennessy and they were lynched. 11 people were lynched. It was mob, you know, in their minds, it was mob justice and it was just an ugly thing. But I think that's also interesting, too, because, you know, sometimes I feel like there is a sort of oppression Olympics that happens. And I think this happens especially in well-intended people who want to be allies and they will focus on one group of people, whether it's black people, Asian people, 
indigenous people, whatever marginalized group you'd like to choose. Um, and in discussing the perils, in discussing the struggles that, you know, the struggles and the perils that these groups have faced, I'm sorry, I'm all, I'm just stumbling all over the place today. I'm so out of sorts with doing videos and I'm trying to find my footing. So thank you for bearing with me. But in focusing on the perils that one group has faced, other groups will be ignored or their struggles will be minimized because there's a feeling that if we mention that other demographics have, have faced the same issues or similar issues, somehow that comes across as minimizing what you know the group you're you're uh, trying to elevate has gone through and and the oppression olympics doesn't help anybody um these lives these 11 lives that were lost that day uh they mattered and it's it's a story that isn't heard very often because when we think of lynching we typically think of black americans and their accomplices um and the fact of the matter is, these, these people were lynched even after they'd been acquitted for the crime they had been accused of, and some had not even faced trial yet. They didn't even have, you know, they hadn't been able to speak their piece yet, and they were lynched. And that matters. It matters because, to me it matters, because, you know, we have a history in the United States of terrible injustice terrible injustice toward people who are not um, white middle-class Americans and it matters regardless of what group it's happening to so that's just something to keep in mind we don't have to pit one group against another when talking about oppression there is no contest here there's nothing to be won by being the most oppressed um, you know when we speak of social justice when we speak of America owning its history those 11 Italian Americans mattered as much as any black Americans being lynched or any white Americans being lynched for uh, standing, aside, standing alongside black Americans and, and elevating their voice. I mean, those things mattered. So just my two cents. If we could let go of the oppression Olympics, that would be awesome. So anyway, so the typical upward trajectory of the Italian Americans... Um, in New Orleans was they would work at a sugarcane plantation as a laborer and then they would save enough money to um, get a truck, start buying food wholesale, starting their own uh, like a fruit stand of some sort and then they would save money from there and then they would be, buy a grocery store. Now in 1890, only 7% of the grocery stores in New Orleans were, were, blah, 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 were owned by Italian Americans. By 1900, it was 19%. By 1920, fully 50% of the grocery stores in New Orleans were owned by Italian Americans. Now, as you might imagine, so imagine this is post-Civil War New Orleans. This is a place where it's really, um, really p putting a fine point on the fact that things have changed, that things are not what they used to be, that if you're, you know, regardless of your race, where you come from, whatever, um, there is an opportunity for you to be successful. And there were people who felt that these Italian Americans who were opening these grocery stores and really starting to just dominate the grocery store game, I guess we could say that, um, they are taking something that other people felt entitled to, and I'm sure you can imagine what other people I'm talking about, um, they felt entitled to it just by virtue of having been born white. And as I mentioned, you know, the obstacles that Italian Americans faced, I mean, it was not made a secret to them whatsoever that there were people who resented their success. There were people who resented their very presence in New Orleans and would really just prefer they not be there. But if they are going to be there, then 
there is a certain type of person who's going to make sure that their life is very, very difficult. And I suspect that has a lot more to do with what the ax man, what, what his motives were than anything whatsoever to do with jazz. Now, they never caught the person who did this, and I have some speculations as to why. One of the issues that, um, that, you know, police departments faced as they investigated this was probably their own prejudice. Um, there was this, this notion that if you were Italian and something violent happened to you, that it probably happened from another Italian family you had beef with and they that family was just carrying out a vendetta against you. Um, you know, there there is some historical basis for the idea of, you know, these vendettas being uh, a motive. But the problem is officers... Or, you know, the police departments did not investigate thoroughly enough to be able to make that determination. They, they um, made an assumption and ran with it. In fact, this, this assumption would actually cause um, a real big problem in the attacks against the Cordomiglia family because, uh, and this happened in a town that was neighboring New Orleans. The ax murderer stopped killing people in New Orleans and went across the Mississippi River and started killing people. And I believe the name of the town is Gretna. And he attacked the Cordomiglia family. They had a two-year-old daughter. He killed the daughter. The mother and the father survived. When the mother and father were in the, laying in their hospital beds recuperating, sorry, there was a phone call. When they were laying in their hospital beds recuperating uh, from their injuries, the police came in and tried to coerce them into saying that it had been their neighbors and business competitors, the Giordano family, who had attacked them and tried to kill them. And they you know, they would not do it. Charlie and Rosie Cordomiglia were adamant that it had not been them. Um, at some point, they did coerce, they did successfully coerce Rosie Cordomiglia into signing a, a an accusation that said, yes, it was the Giordanos. They attacked me. They tried to kill me. They killed my daughter. Etc. Now, now Charlie Cornemiglia in, continued to insist that no, it was not them. Um, but they had somehow managed to get Rosie Cornemiglia to say that the father and son in the Giordano family were tried and found guilty. Um, the father was given a life sentence. The son was sentenced to hang. Rosie Cordomiglia later said, you know, she recanted her accusation. She said that she had been coerced. Eventually, um, the father and son were exonerated. But the, the point is, had the police not been so focused on making a case for which the only evidence they had was this coerced accusation, I mean, you have to wonder how many things did they miss that might have led them to the right person. My suspicion is they were not so much interested in finding the right person as much as they were in just getting this resolved and putting it behind them. Because you have to understand, people were terrified. There were people, you know, Italian Americans in New Orleans and the surrounding area were especially terrified of this killer that was clearly targeting uh, families like theirs to the point that um, a lot of men would stay up all night long uh, keeping watch over their families in case this individual showed up to harm them. So I suspect not only did they want to, did the police want to call this resolved and put it behind them, but it was also easier to assume that it was two Italian families that had a problem with each other then it was to acknowledge that there is a nameless, faceless killer on the loose. You have no idea who it is or how to stop them. 
and you're living in a city of people that are living in absolute terror. I would imagine that it is a combination of a lot of factors that led to the Axeman not being, you know, these crimes not being investigated as thoroughly as they should have been, and also led to them not catching the guy ever. So as time went on, there would be more murders that would be attributed to the Axeman, but though it, those were never definitively proven to be the Axeman's handiwork. As far as um, murders that we know for certain can be attributed to the Axeman, those stopped in 1919, and the Axeman was never caught. So what we are left with was who wrote the letter? Because it is believed it was not actually the axe man who wrote the letter and given the content of the letter versus what we know of the axe man and what his motives most likely were. Um, that makes a lot more sense. Now, the, one, uh, an author who wrote, M Miriam Davis, she was the author of The Axe Man of New Orleans, The True Story. Um, she said, from what we know of the actual axe man, he was not... You know, apparently the way he carried out his murders and so forth were not reflective of a well-educated person, which the um, letter in the way it is written and the verbiage used definitely speaks to someone who has an education. The description of the axe man from those who survived the attacks was a working class, either white or mixed race man. Um, his method of entry into these homes indicated he was a, an experienced burglar. Um, so this was not someone who spent a lot of time uh, hitting the books. Let's just say that. Now, I also want to say here, because <laughs> I think this is important, you don't have to be ed you know, book educated to be intelligent. I don't want that, you know, I want to make sure that message gets out there because I think it's very easy to dismiss people who don't have a, a formal education as being um, unintelligent, and that's just simply not the case. There's, there are all different ways of, all different types of intelligence out there, and just because someone doesn't have um, a formal education or the same level, level of education as you might, that doesn't mean they're not smart. So that's important to me, so I had to say it. Now, what she, what she said was that the person who most likely wrote the letter was jazz composer John Joseph Davila. Why does she think that? Well, shortly after the letter came out, in fact, it was almost immediately after the letter came out, um, he released a composition called The Mysterious Axe Man's Jazz or Don't Scare Me, Papa, and he made a whole lot of money off of that song. Um, I did find it on YouTube. There are actually several different versions of it because it's going to sound different depending on who's playing it and how they improvise. But I did include a link to one by the Squirrel Nut Zippers in my description here. But she said, you know, given the timing of the letter and the timing of the release of the song, um, it's very likely that this jazz composer is also the one who wrote the letter. And in that respect, it was indeed marketing genius. Not only did that letter prompt people to uh, get to the dance halls and the clubs and enjoy some jazz, or if they weren't doing that in the dance halls and clubs, they were playing it at home. Um, like I said, every jazz band in New Orleans had a gig uh, the night of March 18th, 1919. And it, it was either at a club or a dance hall or someone's home. So in that regard, it was really a stroke of genius to write that letter. However, um, minus points for making light of the deaths of your fellow human beings. My goodness, talk about playing on people's fears to make a buck. Okay, I'm going to pause and finish this mostly because I have no idea what I'm doing or where I'm going with this and it's hard to get to um, find direction while I'm running my mouth. So I will be back in just a moment to wrap this up. Hang out with me for a little bit longer, please. I'll see you when I get back. All right, I am back. 
I applied lashes for the first time in I don't even know how long and I kind of remember why I don't wear them very often. They are indeed a pain to put on. I don't know how people can wear them every day. Although I guess if you wore them every day, you'd be very adept at applying them. Anyway, so when I started um, reading up on the Axe Man, I really anticipated that it was just going to be like a silly story, something along the lines of an urban legend. And I was really shocked in the worst way to know the whole story behind it. And I think it's unfortunate that stories like this are not more um, I guess common knowledge. I mean, you can find information about it for sure, but it's not anything that people really talk about very much. Um, and the Axeman murders, that was not the first time Italian Americans had been targeted in New Orleans. Apparently, from what I read, it happened again, or it happened previously from 1910 to 1911. And of course, you know, I told you about the lynchings, I told you about um, sentiments expressed even years later by a judge in New Orleans about how Sicilians are not trustworthy people and so forth. So um, I think it's important to share stories like this. Number one, because I think they're, uh, I mean, I was, I got interested in it just because I was curious and it's always good to um, pursue those questions that your mind pops into your head in the middle of the night. But I also think it's important to share these stories because it's important to have a whole picture of, you know, the, the history of this country as far as um, how people who are not white have been treated. I hear, we all hear probably all the time about how people need to just get over things and that was a long time ago, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's easy to think that things like this happened. I mean, this did happen a long time ago, but it's easy to think that things of this nature all occurred a long time ago when in fact, um, things like this are not too far back in history whatsoever. I mean, things like this still happen right now. Probably the most, one of the most vulnerable groups in America right now is, Asi is Asian Americans who are unfortunately feeling the brunt of a lot of misinformation about the pandemic and how it started and so forth. Um, and people are taking their anger out on people who had nothing to do with any of this. They're just surviving just like you and me. And, you know, but like I said, it's, there's not an oppression Olympics. No one should have to feel unsafe. No one should have to feel targeted. Um, no one should have to worry if their race or ethnicity is going to make them more uh, vulnerable to attack from ignorant people. So I think that's a lesson that can be learned from this. Um, again, this is something that I think a lot of people don't know about and they don't really understand the um, obstacles that Italian Americans had to overcome. Like I think that most of us have an understanding that immigrants have always faced challenges in this country, but I don't know if people in general really understand what those challenges entailed, and sometimes it could be, it could be threatening to their very life. So I think it's important to tell these stories. They're interesting and they're educational. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Again, I apologize for the way I <laughs> stumbled over my words. It's so weird to have that issue, but it had been a couple weeks since I made a video, so it is what it is. Um, if you liked this video, I do have links in the description uh, for places that you can uh, offer your financial support for future videos, but let's be honest, even if you don't, I'm still going to do these. I also have an Etsy shop, and I will put a link to that in the description as well. For those of you who don't know, I have um, an Instagram account in which I post poems that I've made out of redacting various passages in the Bible and making them say something more affirming and welcoming and, and kind. <laughs> um, and I have taken some of those poems and uh, made them available as prints in my Etsy shop. I also do portraits, which was a talent I did not know I had until like a couple months ago and I realized that I'm actually 
pretty decent at doing portraits, which was kind of a mind-blowing thing. Anyway, stay safe out there. Uh, vaccines or not, we are still in the middle of a pandemic. So uh, please be careful out there. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Don't shoot on yourself or anyone else. Um, I appreciate you so much. Thank you for being here. You make doing these videos so much fun. And if you enjoyed the video, please share it. Please leave some supportive comments. Um, subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed. And I will see you again very, very soon. Me and my eyelashes. Maybe. Maybe with the eyelashes. All right. Have a great rest of your day. I will see you again very soon. Bye.